member of the Friends of the Library Club and your Master of Ceremony for today. On behalf of the library, we would like to warmly welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Puan Rashid Puan Rashida Rida Sheikh Khalid, the Director of Copyright Division, Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia, or my IPO, and all of our guests to today's talk entitled, Copyright Law, Its Relevance, Importance, and How It Affects Our Daily Life. First and foremost, we appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you will find the program we have lined up for you to be fruitful and engaging. Today, we are so lucky to have Puan Rashida in the house. Thank you, Puan, for meeting us today, who is willing to share some valuable inputs with us. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, this is the second time we organize a talk on copyright after last Wednesday's session with Prof. Ida Madiha from ECHO. Praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have been graced by the chance to virtually meet in this beautiful morning. Before we move on, let us begin with the recitation of dua led by Inche Ahmad Zaki Rashid. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta ja'al hazna illa shi'ta sahla. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'a wa rizqan tayyiba wa amalan mutakabbala. Rabbana Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmatan wa hayyan amna rashada Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanah wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhaban nar wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Thank you Inch Zaki for that beautiful recitation of dua just now now, without further ado, I would like to welcome Madam Noraini Mukhtar, covering Chief Librarian, to give an opening speech and remarks. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. MC, our handsome brother Hafiz, for your willingness to MC this humble but beneficial session, inshallah. Thank you, everybody, for being present at this session today the respected Head of Research of Kulias and Education Centres and other faculty members and of course our beloved fellow librarians. Our appreciation should also be related to our hard-working copyright unit team headed by Puan Nozelatun. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. Jazakumullah khair. Okay, uh, we have heard before this from uh, Professor Ida Madiha of ICOL about the concept of intellectual property and the laws of copyright implemented local and internationally. And today, we'd like to listen to the authority directly handling the registration of the copyright applications and thus the protection of the copyrighted works. So we have here with us today, Pon Rashida Riyabo, Sheikh Khalid, the Director for Copyright Division Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia, in short, my IPO. Betul, eh? Puan Rashida? Okay. Puan, uh, I'd like to voice our appreciation for your willingness to impart invaluable knowledge to us within the confines of the title, Copyright Law, Its Relevance, Importance, and How It Affects Our Daily Life. So, uh, thank you, Puan Rashida, for being with us today. And uh, I think without further delay, I'd like to pass the virtual floor back to Brother Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Raini Mukhtar, for the opening speech. We we'll on to the main event now. I would like to welcome Juan Rashida Rido Sheikh Khalid, the Director of Copyright Division, my IPO, to deliver her talk. The floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and a very good morning. Blessed morning today. Uh, I'm very privileged to uh, be given the opportunity uh, to talk to um, our uh, friends here in the uh, Daral Hikmah uh, Library, International Islamic University. Did I say it right? Correct? 
is it, is it true? Yeah. Okay. Library Hikmah. All right. Okay. And thank you, uh, Madam Noraini Mukta, um, and um, our Mr. MC. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, I will go straight into um, the virtual seminar. Uh, well, honestly, I do feel a little bit uh, uh, awkward. <laughs> this is, I guess, uh, uh, the unprecedented way of uh, giving seminar. All the while, I would like to, of course, uh, more comfortable by having the face-to-face -face interactions. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself, but I believe here that there are 40 people um, on the other side of the screen who are watching me. Um, so I, I hope and I, I pray that um, this will be beneficial to everyone uh, for what I, I'm about to give the uh, deliver the seminar. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, the topic of today is the copyright law, uh, its relevance, importance, and how it affects our daily life. Okay, next. Um, okay, first of all, I will have to go back to the big picture of uh, copyright, which is an umbrella uh, from in the intellectual property components. Um, I believe that everyone has, uh, from Dr. Ida's um, presentation, that she has touched on what are intellectual property components. So uh, briefly, I'm just going to um, just go through it uh, for a while, that intellectual property components consist of the three uh, things here, which is the industrial property that consists of patents, uh, which is uh, the protection given to the functions uh, of a product or a process. Um, and we have trademarks. Trademarks is the easiest components of IP because it is actually relating to the logo, the marks, the signs, anything. You go around you, you see those brands, so that those are trademarks. And industrial designs are actually referring to the uh, the designs of, of, of a product just on the appearance uh, side of, of it and uh, and it doesn't uh, doesn't protect the functions because those will be covered under patents and geographical indications are those uh, that indicates the product with that associates with the geographical uh, situation for example like Labu Sayong, uh, like Sarawak pepper, because the pepper is very, very reputable and you can only find that fragrance of that Sarawak pepper in Sarawak. And uh, also have the integrated circuit layout design, which is also the uh, extensions of industrial design because it's a protection for the layouts and semiconductors. On the other components, it's just copyright, copyright alone. It is distinct from industrial property because copyright, as we can see later on, we're going to emphasize on what copyrights are. Uh, so it is on its own. And of course, the other components is the common law. So it is by way of contractual in, in this country. And what are the, but they are still intellectual property. So what are they? They are trade secrets. Uh, so for example, like KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. The, so the recipes are actually a secret. So, they do not divulge it to others, to the public to see it, so that um, they could still keep it as a confidential information. And uh, we also have unfair competitions, um, which is a, a very old, um, uh, very conventional way of uh, protecting intellectual property uh, derived from the Berne Convention. And we have the misappropriation doctrine for misrepresentations and passing off. Passing off is for the unregistered trademark. So you have the common law protections to it. Okay, next. Um, so just a little bit of an outline here. So we're going to look emphasis more on the copyright and what are the requirements for copyright, the scope for protections and the copyright law. Uh, voluntary notifications is a system that uh, uh, an initiative under MIPO for protecting just to prove ownership. Uh, we will touch a little bit on the licensing bodies or uh, usually it's loosely called the CMOs for collecting management organizations. Uh, or some international treaty governing copyright and we'll also look at the international development um, that's going on um, uh, in internationally which is at the moment touches on the copyrights and COVID-19. Um, after the presentation, we will um, 
open up for q and A. I believe there are some burning questions from everyone here, uh, 44 participants. So um, feel free to ask me questions and also feel free to interrupt me if, if you feel that uh, there's some queries that you really need. To get, uh, when can you uh, change the slides? Okay, so what is copyright? So copyright here you can see is an exclusive right given to the right holders for certain durations of time. So in Malaysia, the duration is if you are an author, so you will be given uh, a life. Hello? 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 Uh, we, we lost you quite a bit just now. Oh, I see. I see. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, okay, let me let me just repeat back. Um, where was I just now? Okay. Um, so, copyright protection in Malaysia is based uh, on the Copyright Act 1987 and the rights of uh, the right here refers to the right to control and it becomes really challenging uh, even for the authorities to uh, make sure that the uh, copyright protections is still intact uh, to the right holders. Right, next. Next. Okay. Uh. <laughs> um, for the protections of copyright, it is uh, governed under the Copyright Act 1987. Um, so it protects the creative work such as books, movies, music, paintings, photographs, software, videos, etc. So as long as you can show that you are the author of the work that you have produced, so you have copyright. So protection given to generally the literary work like books, uh, journals, um, uh, even lyrics that you compose. There's a musical works like the scores, music scores, uh, the artistic works and sculptures and um, the paintings. Uh, you have also films, sound recordings, uh, broadcasts and also performers. Okay, next. Um, and a little bit of an international treaty. Uh, some of these are, these are the international, international treaties that are involved with copyrights. So we have the Bern Convention, which is one of the fundamental um, conventions that we have become a member. This is the oldest form of protections, uh, sorry, uh, international treaty with regards to copyright. So uh, we Malaysia become a member since 1990. So the, the Copyright Act is shaped by all these international treaties. So how the international treaty um, works is it gives you that certain rights that the uh, under the international treaty, which is binding under the national law, because it has also become incorporated into the law. And of course, the other one is the TRIPS agreement, call it TRIPS, which is the trade related aspect of intellectual property rights agreement. And uh, Malaysia become a member since 1st of January, 1995. Uh, and there's also an element of copyright, which is of course uh, taken from Berne Convention. And it has given a little bit of uh, elements on the trade aspect, uh, which, uh, which is a fundamental treaty also, which uh, can be seen in the Copyright Act Malaysia. 
Um, the other, the other um, treaty is the Rome Convention for the Protection of the Performers, Producers and Phonograms and Broadcasting. Now, Malaysia is not a party, but although we're not a party, but there are certain elements of the Rome Convention, which is also ca uh, can be seen incorporated in the Copyright Act uh, by virtue of the um, the law that which, ha which has been inherited uh, from the Copyright Act Malaysia, which is derived from the British Copyright Law. So in that respect, you can see that element of Rome Convention in regards to the protection of broadcast uh, also uh, incorporated here. Um, and quite recent, in 2012, uh, we have the WIPO Performance Phonograms Treaty and the WIPO Copyright Treaty. These are called the WIPO Internet Treaties. Now, these treaties are also um, uh, the treaty that has been exceeded by, by Malaysia because of its uh, importance with regards to the digital environment. So uh, in, the tw in 2012, uh, quite a major amendment has been made in the Copyright Act to take into account all the international uh, trend and development with regards to the digital environment. And uh, there are also two other important treaties which Malaysia uh, has yet to join. That is one for the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual um, this treaty is uh, giving um, enhanced protections and power to the performers. So Malaysia has yet to join. And the other one is the uh, Marrakesh Treaty, which is very important because this is um, the only treaty that has the human rights aspect and giving the in inclusivity where, say, books, um, reading materials are not only for the visual people, but, but also uh, to be accessed uh, without any uh, hindrance to the visually impaired person. So Malaysia is going towards um, the uh, ratifying this Marrakesh Treaty, inshallah, but because of the COVID-19, so I think it's a little bit delayed. Uh, we, we hope to get those um, treaty uh, in place by, say, next year. Okay, next. Right, uh, we'll have a look at the requirement for copyright. Okay, next. The okay, next. Copyright, uh, as you can see, uh, for the requirement, it, first of all, it requires it to be original. It has to be originality. It's not novel, like uh, uh, unlike the industrial property components. All you need to show is that originality, that, it, that you are the one, these are the manuscript, you are the one who scribed it, and these are the one that you made it yourself. So those originality aspect is very important in order for you to get the copyright protections. And secondly, it also requires to be written down, recorded, and reduced to material forms because otherwise it will just becomes an idea. I can just say that I have an idea, but what proof do I have that that is my copyright? So it has to be written down, recorded, and reduced to a material form. And also it has to be published in Malaysia. But, it, but also even if it's not published in Malaysia for a certain duration, say for a few months, uh, but you can somehow uh, prove that it is uh, published in Malaysia within a certain time, then uh, it can still um, get the copyright protection in the country. Okay, next. Now, uh, again, on the originality requirements, this is the part where it is quite important because um, like I've just mentioned just now, you do not need the novel novelty requirement. Uh, so the threshold is quite, um, it's not so high. Uh, all you need is just some sufficient effort. Uh, in this effort, you need to prove that there are some skills, efforts, and judgment has been put in the work that you produce. Because at the end of the day, these are the things that if it goes to court, there is a dispute, these are the things that the court would look at. All right, next. Next. Okay. Um, also, there are things that cannot be copyrighted. Uh, things like, okay, can you just press some, some, uh, uh, okay. So, as you can see, those little X there. So, um, ideas, procedures, methods of operation, mathematical concept, facts, and discovery. These are the things that cannot be copyrighted for policy reason. And it's, it can be seen in Section 7, uh, Subsection 2, Capital A of the Copyright Act. Okay, next. Right. 
okay, again, why are, why are ideas um, unable to be protected? Because ideas is something that everyone can claim that they have ideas, but it has to be expressed. So the ideas and the way you express it by material form, reduce it into the material form, then you only you will get the copyright protections. Now, the copyright protection is an automatic protection. So it is easy to get copyright protection. It is automatic. It doesn't require any form of formality uh, to register register but what is uh, what is difficult and remain difficult is proving your copyright okay next i'll go in further into that okay, next. Uh, before that uh, you know the idea yes. you know, if it is just being put on paper and in in a scribbled form and all that uh, that can be copyrighted also that is copyright. That is the uh, most important thing. Uh, the manuscript, the one that you just jot down, those are actually, me it means that you have already reduced it to material forms. And those are very important things that should not be thrown away. Because say, for example, if there's a dispute, a contest, uh, whether somebody else claimed to be the copyright owner of that work, and then you can show to court that you have uh, produce it earlier than whoever that uh, claimed to be the copyright owner because those are the things that can prove to you well time because time is everything in intellectual property because that you can show that you have done that since say uh, 2016 but the other person uh, is alleging that um, they've just done it this year so those are the little, little things that can really help you to prove ownership later on so I always tell uh, people, do not throw away your uh, manuscript, all those little things that you scribble and so on, because those are the things that you can prove that when did you first started to produce that work. Okay. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, sure. All right. So I'll, uh, I'll move on to um, Section 7 and 8 of the Copyright Act. So uh, as we can see, so... Um, I've already um, separate this three. I mean, this is how the regime of the copyright actually is. So copyright is actually is the author's right. So it relates to the literary work, the artistic work, and musical works. And for the protection is life of the author plus 50 years after death. Uh, but for the related rights, which is also sometimes known as the neighboring rights, uh, the protections for the person behind the work so these are sometimes the uh, performers themselves or people who are arranging in the films but because they are not really literally the author so they are um, they are also categorized in related rights so these are like films sound recordings broadcasts and the performance rights and we also have the derivative works this is um uh, what it means is just the adaptation so if there's a book so and um, it is made into the film so that's the derivative work okay next okay is here uh, can you just uh, press one more press again okay so derivative works uh what it means here is like the original work the the book uh harry potter and then it was made into film um and also the original work uh it's made into translation uh, which is translated into the uh, Japanese culture, the book on uh, Japanese culture. So this is what it uh, means by derivative works. Okay, next. Okay, now we'll have a look at some of the rights in copyright. Now, copyright is a very powerful tool. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is the underlying um, concept for the creative work. So it has to be the foundation for any creative works that's going on. Without the rights in copyright, there are no way that the creators can be incentivized, rewarded, and uh, and also getting the protections. So in, in the copyright, there are three rights here that we're talking about. One is the economic rights uh, for the authors, for them to gain back uh, for the, the seed that they sow, um, and it's for the authors the corporate owners and also the performers. Um, we also have the moral rights. So the moral rights is, for example, here you see that um, uh, the book, Harry Potter, 
So we jolly well know that the author of the Harry Potter is who, who is the author? Is it J.K. Rowling? Okay, let's just say yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's J.K. Rowling. So somebody just um, uh, delete the name of the author and put their name there. As you can see here, that uh, they put the other name, say Ahmad Albab. So the uh, in moral rights which uh, will not be disrupted, even if the rights has been transferred. Um, the, the moral rights stay. So in no event, in no circumstances, that the name of the author can be, can be changed to somebody else. So the, the original uh, owner or the author can um, challenge this in court in case um, their moral rights has been... Um, disturbed okay and of course uh rights and copyright is most important part is you have the legal rights because by uh, by this by garnering the copyright protection meaning that a person has the exclusive right to authorize again to control and to prohibit others from using their work unauthorizedly um and they can institute proceedings in the court of law all right next um, and so this is, um, as you can see, how the rights uh, can, can be enforced by the copyright owner and how it can be monetized so that the person can really uh, see that copyright is relevant, not just as protection, but also as a way of monetizing their work. So as the author, they can do it by way of any business dealings two ways of exploiting the copyright. One is by way of assignment, or if you can say it uh, in a tangible property, say, uh, means it's by way of sale, or you can license it. By licensing it, meaning you are just giving it a permission to the others to use it for a certain duration and a certain uh, time. So you can also acquire some royalty to be given back to you or uh, for free, like Creative Commons. So these are the way that as a copyright owner, by having the exclusivity, they are able to exploit the work that uh, they have produced. And uh, as a copyright owner, they can be uh, the original owner, or if it has been transferred, it is the new copyright owner. And they also have the legal rights and the economic rights as, uh, such as uh, the same as the authors. The only thing that they do not have is the moral rights because the moral rights would stay with the author. All right, okay, next. Um, okay, so I, I did mention a little bit about the author's moral rights. So this is the right to be identified as the author or creator of a work. Um, it is the right of the author to be acknowledged in a correct way. Um, they shouldn't put the other author's name when the other author did not uh, participate or put any skill and effort into the book. So it is morally wrong. Uh, so there are some ethical as a foundation in the copyright law. And uh, the right of the author is also uh, to object against distortions, mutilations, or other modifications of the work that significantly, significantly alters the work and regard it as adversely affecting the author's honor and reputation. There is a, uh, uh, recently there is a case on this moral right um, because, okay, uh, there is a sculpture in one of the uh, council, city council, and what happened is that the city council uh, do not feel that they want those sculptures to be there anymore. So what happened is they move the sculpture somewhere else. Okay, it's not about mutilating, but they move it. So um, the author was upset and bring it to court. And um, by, by virtue of this section 25, the authors did get uh, the reward for this author's right, for the right not to have the sculptures to be removed or mutilated and distorted in such a way. So uh, it seems that uh, some of the authors are aware of their rights and, and has been uh, using the Copyright Act um, in court. All right, next. Next. 
Um, okay, and the other thing is, uh, 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 can you go back there? I think we may, we skip the legal rights just now. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, legal rights, uh, they have the remedies. Uh, also in, in copyright, they have civil and criminal. Uh, for civil, you can claim for damages, injunctions, account of profit. Account of profit meaning, uh, for example, that um, there is this person who um, infringe your copyright and they have made money by uh, photostating um, thousands and thousands of your book without authorizations. So you can go to court and get an account of profit of how much that you should be getting that profit instead of the other person who, inf uh, who infringed it. So these are some of the remedies that are given under the civil law, uh, sorry, under the uh, civil. Um, and the uh, criminal is uh, there's a fine and imprisonment. And there is also for copyright piracy, it is a criminal act, uh, which is also um, also expelled in the in the legal rights under the law. Okay, next. Next is uh, the performance right. And in the performance right, <coughs> is uh, section 16A. Um, in 2020 and 2012, there was uh, uh, an amendment to the um, clause uh, provisions regarding to the performance right. And the rationale was to address the grievance of the performers um, and to improve the existing performance right and to facilitate Malaysia's exception to the international treaty, which is the WPPT. And um, in section 16B, it's talking about equitable equitable remunerations. Uh, or in Malay, they call it haqsa sama. Now, equitable remuneration, how is it different from royalty is that Equitable remuneration, you can negotiate as to how much that um, the willing buyer and the willing uh, seller uh, to get from the work that has been produced. So, for example, film producers said that um, they're willing to um, give the performance, say, 50% uh, from the profit that they gain uh, from, from the film. So, it can be negotiated. That's why it's an equitable remuneration. And so uh, it is hoped to serve as a catalyst for performance to improve creativity and innovations. Um, and um, the performance, uh, will, if they're not happy uh, for some reason on the contractual terms on this equitable remuneration, uh, they, are, they, they can bring it to the tribunal, the copyright tribunal, and to... Um, to hear cases for the amount payable uh, that that is in question, and um, also to vary any contract on any previous determination made by the tribunal. So the performers are also uh, have the avenue or a platform for them to bring their matters to the tribunal. But unfortunately, until today, none of the performers has come to the copyright tribunal for all these cases. So it's a shame, isn't it? All right, okay, uh, next. We will look at the exceptions and limitations. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will be speaking a lot on the exceptions and limitation because um, uh, my, the audience are coming from the library backgrounds and lecturers, so um, in copyright, exceptions and limitations are the most important parts. In, um, and especially in library, so we will look, uh, we'll be focusing more on these issues and what are the exceptions and limitations in copyright. So as you know, copyright, there are so many stakeholders, interest group that will be affected by copyright. One of it are, of course, the right holders, the copyright holders, the copyright owners, and on the other hand, are the users. So the, in order to maintain the appropriate balance between the interests of the copyright owners and the users of protected works. So the copyright law has, you, has this, this exceptions and limitations as a policy space for the country to use and uh, so that these protected works, works can be balanced and used uh, by users while at the same time uh, does not affect the rights of remunerations to the copyright owner. Because we do not want, at the end of the day, users will enjoy using it, but the copyright owner will suffer. The, the person who come up with the journal doesn't get back any money or return. 
because users are using it. So there's, there is an upset on the balance there. So what we need to do is striving to get that balance between the users and also the corporate owner. So in short, exceptions are the permitted acts in relation to the copyright work, which would otherwise become an infringement. So um, these are the things where the corporate owner would say, okay, these are not, the, they are, these are not uh, uh, infringement. You are allowed to use it. You are permitted to use it. Okay. But there are certain, uh, on certain circumstances only that you can use these exceptions and limitations. And these are called the fair dealings. Okay, next. Okay, now the fair dealings are uh, in the in Malaysia. Um, we use the concept of fair dealings, unlike in the United States, they call it fair use. So there are certain difference there between the fair use and the fair dealings. Fair use is where in in the United States they're giving the liberty for the courts to uh, reasons to give reasons. And they can, in court, they can just balance it whether those are used that is considered fair or otherwise. But in Malaysia, which uh, the, the law derived uh, uh, from the uh, United Kingdom, so we're using the concept of fair dealing, which is basically, uh, uh, it's, it's like a list of things that are permitted and things which are not. So this is how it's done in Malaysia. So there are still uh, academic discussions on whether Malaysia should adopt the fair use principles or the fair dealings principle. So I'll leave that academic side, uh, academic discussion alone. Otherwise, it's going to take two or three days, which is not going to be, it's not going to end very soon. So in Malaysia, the fair dealings are only primarily for research purposes, for private study, for criticism and review of reporting of news and current event. Next. Next. Okay, and the rest will be the exceptions to copyright. Uh, can you go back there? Can you can you go back? To, uh, yes, okay, to these slides. On these exceptions and uh, to copyright, um, the exceptions are for parody, pastiche, and caricature. So if somebody made a parody, uh, of the work. So the copyright owner shouldn't get upset because there's an exception to copyright. It's just for parody. So, and it's not really for uh, purpose of a gain, trying to gain commercial gain. So uh, also if there's an incidental inclusion of an artistic work situated in a public place. Uh, so these are also exceptions. So it is a list of things that are permitted. And you can see here the reproductions and distribution of copies of any artistic work permanently situated in a place where it can be viewed by the public. So that can be an exception to copyright. The inclusion of a work for teaching purposes and compatible with fair practice. So this will be relevant for schools, universities, or education institutions. So you can include a work for teaching. For example, you want to put there a film, but you cannot put the whole films and claim it to be for teaching purposes. So that will not be fair dealing anymore. But you can put an excerpt uh, of it. There are certain amount in certain jurisdiction. They would also stipulate the amount that is permitted for this. For example, schools to use it for teaching purposes. Uh, the inclusion in a film or broadcast of any artistic work situated in a place where it can be viewed by the public, and that is also an exception. And also, incidental inclusion of a work in an artistic work, sound recording, film, or broadcast. So, um, for example, you can. Uh, but incidentally, you can see, say, for example, um, a, a film, um, uh, a reality show, and then um, you can see someone is wearing the T-shirt of um, with with a copyright work, say, of a Mona Lisa. So if it's it's just incidental, so that is so the owner of Mona Lisa, for example, cannot come and say that. Um, those are my those are my work 
that's copyrightable. You cannot put that inside the broadcast or sound recording. So, but then uh, the defense is that look, it is, it is just an incidental inclusion of the work. Okay, right next. Okay, uh, others is of course uh, inclusion of a work in a broadcast performance showing or playing to the public. Um, if it's just way of illustration for teaching purposes, so you need to prove that. Um, <clears throat> any use of a work for purpose of examination, uh, setting the question, you also will get the permitted um, act and the uh, reproduction made in school, university or education institution of a work included in a broadcast intended for such school, universities or education institution, meaning you can copy copies that are made in school uh, which is included in a broadcast uh, intended for such schools. So these are the permitted acts. Okay, next. Um, also, because it's, it's a long list really. So um, also the making of sound recordings, films of a broadcast for private uh, and domestic use of person by whom the sound recording films are made, meaning if there is a little bit of a sound recording here, uh, but you can say that, hey, this is just for my consumption, for my own consumption. So um, there is not, there, it is not an infringement there. Um, also, this, uh, the making and issuing copies for the blind people. Uh, so whatever you copy those books for the purpose of the blind people is also in exceptions. And reading a recital of reasonably extract literary in public is sufficient acknowledgement so long as you give credit where the credit is due, then you won't be in trouble for copyright infringement. All right, next. Um, okay, and then for libraries, exceptions for libraries here. And this is an excerpt of the provisions in the Act, where it says that any use made, uh, any use, so as you can see, it's quite wide, the power, that whatever use by the government, uh, by the, the National Archive or State Archive, by National Library or State Library, or by such public libraries, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then as the minister may by order prescribe. So at the end of the day, because the list is uh, not, it's exhausted. It's not exhausted. So um, what we need to do is, um, my poll will need to um, come up with the order, which which is to be, uh, executed by the minister, need to get it signed by minister to say such uh, things that, um, or, or what kind of work that the library feels should be exceptions so that the library are able to to, uh, to exercise their duty without feeling um, worried uh, of infringing other, other person's copyright. So, um, as long as you can show that there's no profit is derived therefrom and no admission fee is charged for the performance showing or playing to the public of the work you say. So for example, in the library now, they may want to use to show some kind of pictures or films and excerpts of the song. So these are the things that you, you, you need to spell it out. Um, uh, so you tell my poll that this is, these are the things that you, you feel that um, is required uh, for library to uh, exercise their statutory function uh, effectively. Right, next. So again on libraries, um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, so minister must prescribe by orders. So this is the order, say, well, then the library can put it, stick it on their wall and say, okay, by order of the minister. So these are the things that um, is um, allowed for the library to use. So for example, um, you have some questions about how can students use those work um, online, um, offline, um, uh, in terminal, uh, outside terminal. So these are the things that you can list out and then um, this is where the my, uh, my poll will come in and then um, we can discuss and then these are the things that we can put forward to the minister says that in, in the interest of public, inter uh, public interest, um, the exceptions for copyright with regards to the library and uh, they would need this to further um, giving access to public uh, to utilize the copyright work. 
without infringing. So, uh, so these are the prerequisites in order for you to have it done uh, by way of uh, uh, an, an annexure to, to the law. All right, next. Okay, on the international development, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there has been a, a, a big, a major focus on the exceptions and limitations. Next, um, especially there has been a studies done uh, for libraries. Uh, so for libraries, there has been a typology analysis by Professor Kenneth Cruz. Um, you can check this um, in WIPO uh, website, WIPO's website. So there is a, a studies done, a typology analysis, also on archive, museums, education institutions, and people with uh, other disabilities. Now, libraries, archives, and museums, and museums have a universally uh, recognized role in delivering key public interest goal. So they can carry out essential goal, essential works to preserve. So preserve is the core uh, number one um, uh, thing that uh, library, libraries uh, statutory function. So to preserve the heritage, um, support the work of the researchers and innovators and provide tools and space for educators and learners. So this is why we know the function of the library is very, very important, very crucial. And to carry out um, uh, the library's um, statutory function, uh, of course, they, you depend in turn on these exceptions and limitations to copyright. This is how all the other libraries uh, internationally been operating. So, um, and, and they also know, uh, everyone knows that these are an inter in accepted, is an accepted and integral part uh, of a healthy copyright system. Um, and this will give government a vital tool for pursuing public interest goals in general, such as preservations of culture, research and education, while also allowing for successful and, su and sustainable, sustainable cultural industry. So um, for the preservations, um, uh, last year I went for the International Conference on uh, Exceptions and Limitations for Library, and uh, it is very interesting to see that the library in the Middle East country, in the war-torn countries, for example, in Syria, in Lebanon, and in um, Egypt, and they are crying for these preservations uh, to be um, to be even more protected because um, the, these original materials that they have was dated back to thousands and thousands of years and even before centuries. So these materials are vulnerable in a war torn uh, uh, countries like that, so they, they, they need to do the restoration uh, to carry out the restoration and necessary to keep a record. So preservations copies can help the, the recreation or replacement of lost works or building. And uh, this is the thing that they said that they're crying for some, some form of um, uh, uh, international norm or, or law so that it can protect the preservations of libraries. So it's quite interesting uh, to, to see how libraries are uh, internationally uh, responding to this international um, uh, development on exceptions and limitations. Uh, so if anyone would want to uh, find out more about these studies done in WIPO, uh, I'm more than happy to share some of the studies. It's in SCCR, um, which is the Standing Committee of Copyright um, and Related Rights. And also now there's, uh, there are many lending activities, uh, which is also uh, worked, um, touches on copyright. For example, the distributions right, the communications to the public rights. And uh, in many countries, um, Library, archive, and muse museums also need the possibility to lend or send copies of work on an ad hoc basis. So how do you do that in, 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 a, in, a, in an appropriate format? So this will all come up with issues on how copyright are to be dealt by uh, libraries in today's world. So it's very challenging. So we also know that the library's function is very important for researchers. Um, both inside and outside of the universities, and the possibility to copy the work 
uh, is really vital. So um, teachers and edu educators also make use of copying provisions in order to develop their course materials for classes and, uh, and the work is, is just uh, enormous. Uh, I mean, the, the um, responsibility of a library. Only when I went to that international conference, and um, I, I feel I feel humbled by by the work done by the library. So uh, kudos to the IIU library also. Uh, I I feel you. And uh, also the orphan works. Now most subjects, most work subject to copyright are either never commercial uh, or are no longer on sale or or af only after a short period. Uh, so as a result, people do not necessarily keep information about the work that they produce, meaning they become an orphan work. So it is meaning uh, it is impossible for you to identify or locate a right holder. So some libraries also will have to handle this kind of issues, a library, archive, and museum, because there are many collections that consist of such orphan works. So how do you handle orphan works? Given that it is not possible to acquire their rights because they do not know who the authors are, so they remain locked away from society and sometimes forgotten. So we also have uh, orphan works, say, derived from the separations of Malaysia and Singapore. So some of those works, we cannot even identify who the authors are. Well, sometimes they even send to the archive, say, in Singapore. So it becomes the the national treasure of Singapore. But the thing is, it could pro probably be uh, our Malaysians authors because we do not know who the authors are. So these are some of the issues in the international level that they are um, issues that has been, um, has been debated, has been discussed, and the functions of the libraries. Um, archives and museums. Okay, next. Right, so um, as we can see, uh, uh, like how I reiterate, the exceptions for library and archive are fundamental to the structure of copyright law uh, throughout the world, and the exceptions play an important role in facilitating library services and, and should have adequate safeguards in place because you are exercising your statutory duties, your statutory functions. So libraries should be able to work without fear of infringing other people's copyright. So libraries need to be empowered in exercising their statutory powers. Okay, next. Okay, uh, next is so um, we can see, uh, like how I mentioned just now, so this uh, is important to, to see uh, that the developments of library and archives and museums where copyright matters. Um, and um, okay, next. We'll see here, this is the studies, the typology, typology work, uh, studies done by Professor Cruz. Uh, and so Professor Cruz has identified that the category and the functions of copyright uh, in the library can be um, uh, yeah, can be as follows. Preservation, which is the core duty of, uh, of library. And so this is for that there are also a questionnaires that I have um, uh, sent to most of the libraries because uh, last year when uh, when we're having the international conference so the uh, WIPO was uh, conducting a study to see what are the needs and how, how are ways for the libra libraries uh, internationally could, internationally could operate better with the copyright system so in this type of study, uh, studies, I think when you have the time, please go through the questions. And if the library in IIU uh, is happy to give me the answer, uh, I'll be very happy because this would also help us in um, coming up with a better provisions in law uh, in trying to um, give an improve uh, for better improvement of the provisions and exceptions for the library as a whole. 
and access. Access is also another category that is important because library uh, inherently would want to give access or making available on terminals and copies, private use. So are these copies for study and research? And so the questions are there for you to ask because this will develop into uh, uh, these questions will, uh, will then help us to determine what are the needs of the library okay and the cross border nowadays with the advent of technology and internet going rapidly beyond our control so the issues of cross border is is something that uh, has become very profoundly uh, in, in today's age so no more that the questions of IP as a territoriality protection uh, has been, uh, would say, disrupted. So even, for example, a lecturer, especially like in IIU, you have um, so many foreigners. So, for example, uh, uh, a lecturer uh, from um, Africa, and then they would take the library loans and work across borders. So um, what are the conditions that can uh, be protected under copyright? And um, do you allow access to the works users outside the country? Sometimes it can be uh, on geopolitical, uh, uh, geographical blocks. So you are unable to access to some of the works or terminals on cross borders. So there are so many other issues uh, that uh, need to be I would say need to be addressed and for the library to tell us what are the things that is needed for you to exercise your work better under the copyright system these days, especially in the digital age. So as you can see, uh, you will have more time to look at this typology done by Professor Kenneth Cruz. Uh, so this is the thing that has been discussed last year in the International Conference of Exceptions and Limitations. Right, next. Okay, so I uh, can see that they also found that there are current drawbacks. Now, studies done in 188 countries, 90 of them, 48% of total, do not explicit, explicitly allow libraries to make copies for research or study. The situation is even worse for archive, with two-thirds, 126 countries or 67% of them are not permitting archive to make copies for research or study purposes. And moreover, 89 countries, which is 47% of the total survey, do not explicitly allow libraries to make copies for preservation purposes. And 85 of them, which is 45% of the total, do not allow archive to make such copies. So this is how you see international, internationally, how diverse are uh, the protections on copyright, the access and the level of copies uh, allowed internationally. Right, next. Uh, so I'm just going to show a little bit on how the international development on archive and copyright. So there's also a studies on archive and copyright conducted by David Sutton. Uh, there's a link there where you can also access if you want to find out more. Um, and so this is the pyramid of how the archive um, functions and how it works. Okay, right, next. Next. Okay, so these are some of the categories of archives, so international model. So archive can also um, become a, a, a source of uh, revenue for, um, for others, for libraries and archives to make money. And then the functions of archive, which is similar to library, is also of utmost importance. Okay, next. Okay, so these are making copies of archives. Uh, also, there was a study based on the study. So these are things that they have um, come up with um, the, the, the studies. Okay, next. Okay, and then uh, these are some of the issues, copyright issues with, with regards to archive, which is the split collections uh, are often held in different countries and the different copyright regimes. So how do you handle that? Cross boundaries, certain types of cultural um, archives are diasporic in nature and often cross boundaries. Born digital archives, 
digitized archive and orphan works. So which I think which is quite uh, familiar to the library as well because it is from the same discipline. Okay, next. Okay, right. So um, I'm also now going to uh, discuss on how do you secure a copyright via the voluntary notification system. As you know that copyright protection is automatic. So you do not you do not have to register your copyright because this is by virtue of the Bern Convention, which requires a no formality, uh, no formality requirement. Why is this so? Because for example, let's just say I have made a book and I have for some reason um, forgot to come and register to my book. So, so uh, along came the other guy who produced the same book and registered it. So the, the other guy would get the copyright protection unlike me. So this is the re policy reason behind it for the no formality requirement for, 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 for copyright. So even if you do not protect, uh, you do not register it, the protection is automatic. So long as you can show that it is original and there's some sufficient effort has been uh, uh, reduced to material form and published in Malaysia. So that will be sufficient enough uh, as a criteria for copyright protections. Now coming back to the securing copyright by voluntary notification next, what you need here, uh, can you uh, press some more? Okay, uh, so for copyright voluntary notifications, what the uh, what MIPO has um, come up in the 2012 uh, amendment is um, to come up with the uh, system of corporate voluntary notification as a prima facie evidence. Uh, can you press some more? Press? Uh, no, no, no. Before that, before that. Okay, uh, sorry. Okay, before, um, what you need is um, before there is a voluntary notification endorsed by the government. So uh, most of the creative people would just have an envelope and then they will just stamp it uh, a self envelope to themselves, post it, and then send it back to them without opening the mail. By doing that, it, so that when, when there are matters who are in dispute in court, they can bring it back, that envelope, the self address envelope, to show to court that the date which has been uh, chopped on, on the post system is the date when they first created it. So those are the initiative done by the creative owners. But MIPO take the initiative to help them to endorse by the government by way of this corporate voluntary notifications. And of course, you know that in court itself, that you can also do it by way of affidavit in court and a statutory declaration. Next. So again, um, because copyright, there's no formality requirement, um, so, person use a postal service to send own work by stamp and open envelope as evidence. Uh, this is how uh, my book of the next. Okay, so you can, as you can see, once uh, a person wants to file for a voluntary notification, uh, this is the uh, the guideline we give on what are the types of work that can be filed under voluntary notification. Uh, so under the literary work, you can see there is a, a few long categories there. Artistic work, musical, films, sound recording, broadcast, and derivative works. So if you're not sure, so you can always refer to this uh, guideline and they will tell you what are the categories under what type of uh, uh, work. So uh, we, we usually, uh, sometimes we also receive um, the forms by owners, um, by applicants who are not sure. Um, yes, I have a work, but uh, what kind of work does this fall under? Does it work, fall under literary work or artistic work? So we would strongly advise that you read up this guideline in order for you to know what are the categories of work that falls under. Okay, next. Okay, next. So voluntary notifications under Section 26, Capital A. Um, again, this is the, uh, oh, can you, okay. So some of the procedure is um, 
you uh, is a notification of a copyright in any work, uh, and then uh, you need to submit the application form, uh, deposit the copyright work, uh, a statutory declaration at the moment, and uh, but, uh, together with the prescribed fee. Prescribed fee, if you ask me, is just approximately about 45 ringgit, depending on the size of the uh, type of CD or USB uh, that, that you submit to my book. Okay, so, but we strongly advise that you deposit the work um, in, in the form of those um, uh, yeah, CD or, uh, or any, any uh, device, a uh, USB stick and so on, because uh, uh, it is good for space saving and, um, and also you get to keep back of your book and so on, the original work. Okay, next. Right, so uh, the copyright voluntary notification is to support and assist copyright owner in issue of ownership. Again, so let me emphasize here, it's not giving protections of copyright because protections of copyright is automatic. What the voluntary notification actually does is to assist the owner, copyright owner, in issue of ownership because it, the improving ownership, that is the most difficult part. Unlike having the protection of copyright. Copyright, you can get automatic protection so long as those criteria can be fulfilled. Okay, so what it does is to give you a prima facie evidence of ownership and this uh, uh, evidence can be rebutted. But, so, but then what happened is it's for the defendant to, to show that those work is, uh, it, the burden of proof will then shift it to the defendant for them to show that it's otherwise. All right, next. Okay, um, how much time do we have? Because um, going further, it is a very a long slide. We have 68 slides. Now it's slide 43. Uh, do you want to go on the limitations of ISP or do you want me to skip? Uh, do let me know. Or I just uh, quickly, briefly go through this ISP. ISP. Uh, minta Puan quickly, briefly go through lah because uh, this are uh, uh, among the important uh, things, especially during the pandemic, right? Okay? okay, all right, great. Okay, now on the limitations of uh, internet service providers, um, liabilities, as we can see now with the, in the dig digital age, the ISPs uh, or the network service providers are the one that provide the services online so it carries the copyrightable materials online but um, it's like for example we can say it's an highway so the highway even there is a uh, robber robbers that goes into the highway so the highway would say say let's just say the highway is plus plus and say i cannot be responsible if there's so, so many robberies that goes through my highway so that is why this isp there is a limitation there's a liability to exclude uh, the liabilities of service provider, so for example, there are robbery or copyright, um, robbery, here, uh, uh, what do you call it, piracy, going through via their highway, so they cannot be uh, liable for everything. So in this provision, it sets out the limit uh, or the uh, limit to the liabilities of service provider where the service provider is not responsible for copyright infringement that goes through their highway uh, if the subscribers are the one who's been uh, committing this offence. So, uh, and the law is in line with the international practice and will assist, hopefully, in the economic growth acceleration. But uh, in the new uh, copyright revision, we will look into this uh, internet service provider's provisions again and see for ways to better enhance this uh, ISP because uh, there has been also cases where these ISPs are hiding behind this liability and say that um, we cannot be, ex be we cannot be uh, held responsible. So there's so many instances when it sometimes it's clear that the ISPs should know that those subscribers are clearly infringing and using materials which is unauthorized inside their, say, for example, Maxis or Cellcom, and you're not doing anything about it. So that's why uh, 
in the um, uh, future revision, uh, there are certain things that we might want to tighten up the ISPs. Okay, next. So again, uh, this is the limit, the liabilities of service providers where the service provider is not responsible for the corporate infringement. And what happened is the work will be removed within 48 hours after receiving takedown. Now, <clears throat> um, this, this provisions was um, made in 2012. And now 48 hours is already seen as very, very late. It's because the problem, the challenge now is that the infringement is a real-time infringement. So even 48 hours is already considered to be a total loss to the copyright owners. Okay, let's have a look at how some of this mechanism work. Next. Next. Okay, so in the civil action, so what happened in under section 43, so the ISP is Maxis. So um, you have the uh, you can exercise your civil action in the section 36 of the Copyright Act and then so the, um, the as a subscriber copyright owner you see that um, the search engine uh, there has been some infringement going on there and so they apply for it to be taken down uh, for example say their song has been played by someone else in uh, using Maxis platform so uh, now, uh, within 48 hours, it has to be removed. Now, and also the corporate owner will send the content provider uh, for it to be, uh, to be, uh, yeah, to be removed from the system. So this is where the civil action comes in. Okay, next. Next. Okay, and... Okay, and uh, on the technological aspect also, you can see that the technological protection measures. Um, okay. Right. Um, here, the proviso of service provider uh, provide access to uploaders. Um, so copyright owner will be given the notice to take down uh, to the person who's been uploading infringing materials. So with the notice of takedown, so you do not see any more of such infringed uh, materials on the um, website. And uh, ISP send, ISP which is Maxis, will send the notice to the uploader. You need to take it out or we will take it out ourselves. And sometimes that's when you see, have you been to the website and say that, um, this site has been uh, take, uh, uh, has been taken down due to copyright infringement and so on. So this is the result of the takedown uh, civil action taken by the copyright owner. Now, only the copyright owners can take down the infringed materials online, not anyone else. So if the copyright owner, sometimes you may wonder, why are there still some movies about... Um, say open pain maybe because open pain doesn't want to take exercise their rights so there's nothing you can do so but then these are the rights actually for the copyright owner to uh, to make sure that their contents are, are online are only the authorized version and not the unauthorized version okay next uh, okay next so uh, another uh, technological aspect is the it's called the te technological protection measures. For example, so uh, you wanted to read uh, an online journal, but you are unable to copy the, the the copy and edit button has been disabled. So this is some of the element of the technological protection measures that has been exercised by the copyright owner. So not just it's a copy. To, uh, it's a control copy, but also access control. So the control uh, element of the copyright owner has now also extended to the access. So, uh, and for example, you can also see um, the uh, the box, 
Okay, uh, next, can you, can you go back? Uh, uh, I want to show you the circumventions of the TPM. Uh, no, no, moving forward, moving forward. Forward. Next, next slide. Yes, okay. Uh, so, for example, here, the Astro Box. Okay, so there are some people out there who are really, really clever. So, they say they want to watch Astro, but they are not the subscribers to Astro. So they circumvent inside the astro box. There is an element of technological protection measure to make sure that only the subscribers who are able to watch the authorized content on the astro. But there are someone else who knows how to play around and then circumvent all this technology. And so they are able to watch without having to pay. In other words, an unauthorized use of it. So in section 41.1, it is an offense in the copyright law. So those who circumvent or cause or authorize it, if they get caught and then uh, upon conviction shall be liable up to 250,000 or imprisonment of not more than five years or both. So as you can see, circumventions of the TPM, uh, technological protection measure is a serious offense. Okay, next. Right, okay. The other kind of protection is the rights management information. In this rights management information, uh, it means that if you remove or alter any of the digital management information, um, you can see later on how this is done. So, uh, in the law, it means the information which identifies the work the author of the work, the owner of any of the right of the work, performer, or the terms and conditions. So this is how it's stipulated in the law. So if you, and the, okay, next. And the offense is actually quite severe. Same like TPM, similar like uh, TPM. Also fine on exceeding 250,000 or imprisonment of not more than five years. Next. So this will illustrate, uh, can you go? Okay, this is an illustration of how our rights management information is altered. Okay, in these alterations of R RMI, for example, let's just say a few lecturers here have come up with the online um, uh, tuition or online, um, I would say, uh, modules. And here you have a few names of them. And then you have reduced it inside a CD. And then someone else let's just say um, someone who wants to make money, they find that uh, this, um, this, this CD of uh, various names of lecturers that come up with this good uh, text on our journals, um, they, they want to put their name in it, for example. Okay, so they alter the digital rights management and then they erase and delete their names and put their name instead. So this is where it becomes an offense. So normally you can see this in um, say music, music CDs where the names of the composers, the lyrics and so on, the performers are there and they can just erase those and put somebody else's name. So this is where the law, uh, copyright law would protect for the alterations of RMI, and the offense is up to 250,000. All right, next. Okay, we'll uh, going to quickly uh, just touch on the copyright and COVID-19, as you can see. Nowadays, uh, no, nobody has um, ever predicted the COVID-19. It, uh, it is a pandemic uh, and uh, quite unprecedented, has also changed how copyrights are ecosystem. As you know that a copyright is um, giving, is, is trying to achieve the balance between the right holders and also the users. And so with the COVID-19, uh, you can also see now that um, more access are uh, needed. It becomes what they said as a non-essentials essentials. It is non-essentials, for example, like uh, entertainment, Yes, there was non-essentials, but it become essentials, for example, when during the lockdown of the COVID-19. 
you need entertainment. You need to to, to watch some movies or hear uh, play some music and hear you know those kind of things. So this is when access or even uh, that is on the entertainment. But for say the school children, lecturers, university students, they are in in real need of books, uh, access to material, so that they are able to continue with their studies. So COVID-19 has uh, made a stretch the copyright, say, for example, the access uh, and the need for the people uh, to also the, the, the people who uh, would benefit this during the COVID-19. And uh, more access to copyright are expected to be given in light of the pandemic situation. For example, say, uh, in all the treaties with regards to, to the Marrakesh Treaty and other treaties uh, of copyright. So there will be an insert. Uh, it, it will insert the access specifically for the COVID-19 situation where um, there will be, say, no remuneration uh, to be paid um, for the copyright owner. But again, uh, since this is fairly new development, so we have not yet uh, anything concrete at the moment from the international development. So these are still um, at a very uh, discussions at the level of uh, still discussions in, in WIPO. So uh, we'll keep in touch and, uh, and the progress and further developments of copyright and COVID-19. But what I can see is that the publishers um, everywhere around the world are giving, say, uh, limited time, free access to say online journals, uh, which otherwise would be only on subscription basis. So uh, I've also seen uh, say music uh, being given for free for for a limited time. So again, it is not free forever, but for a certain uh, period, uh, in order to um, to help salvage the situation. So that's why these are the non-essentials essentials. Okay, next. Um, before I uh, move to copyright uh, infringement, are there any questions so far? No? Okay, I'll just continue with the copyright infringement. I think everyone will uh, have an idea what an infringement is. So infringements, um, as you know, all creators, including photographers and illustrators, are entitled to be paid uh, if their work is used, commercially or otherwise. Uh, this will encourage creativity and make, uh, and then makes more image uh, av uh, available for use. However, if things are taken without authorized, so when another person is using the copyright owner's work without permission or authorization, it becomes an infringement. If those exceptions are used outside of the scope of those listed uh, just now, when I said there was a long list of exceptions, so those can become, can constitute an infringement. So some of the example of infringement here you can see is like making copies uh, or reproduction without consent or license. So say you take the whole book and you copy it, so that will become an infringement, but you are only allowed in exceptions, you're only allowed to take only a certain amount of a book for your own consumption. So in order for you to be, um, uh, to be uh, considered as not infringing. So if you perform or exhibit to the public, so for example, you take somebody else's song and then uh, you try to make money out of it. So these are actually infringing. Uh, you making derivative work, uh, say so adaptations on translation from uh, a Bollywood movie and then you make that into a, a Malay film. So uh, that is uh, also um, infringement unless you get the consent of lice or license from the owner or you distrib distribute to others. This is like the P2P, what? Peers to peers, uh, sharing online, uh, bit torrents. So these are all by way of distributing, making available to the others. But right, next. 
Okay, so these are some of the examples of copyright infringement. So you can see, okay, so making copies uh, in CDs and sell, bootlegging, piracy, transmitting music uh, in internet, um, copy chapter in a book and sell. So this is like how I wish. Okay, copyright infringement, there is a difference since because uh, my audience here is from a university, from a library. So I think it's important that I also touch on plagiarism. Next. Okay, as you can see here, for plagiarism, um, that is an act of taking someone else's work and claiming it as your own. It is not necessarily an infringement, but we will see later the difference between a plagiarism and an enforcement, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, copyright infringement. So for students, um, sometimes plagiarism can occur because um, a lack of or academic originality, uh, often it's a result of the inability to keep up with the assessment demands, poor time management, poor linguistic ability, and poor note-taking practices in class. There are many, very many reasons, whether intentionally or not. <clears throat> um, and it's an act or instance of using or closely imitating the language and thoughts of uh, another author without authorization and the representations of that author's work and then they use it and uh, claim it as one's own, as by not crediting the original author. So uh, plagiarism is often um, uh, is a, is a construct of ethics. It is not a construct of law, unlike the infringement. But however, next, next, the long-term effect you can see here is that um, it can have potential dire consequences sometimes many years after the fact maybe it can be expelled i'm not sure it all depends on the uh, each in, uh, institution establishment uh, because it discredits the author so authorship is regarded as high value in copyright because um, copyright was first derived from the author's right so uh, this is something that is uh, very noble so uh, the author has put their skill and enormous, if not sufficient, effort in the work. So that's why plagiarism should be taken seriously. Okay, next. And some of the long-term effects is we can see that uh, perhaps payment of royalties to some because those works has been disrupted. Uh, it's probably a costly court battle to clear a name and uh, there's the court sanctions. Um, so if your work is found to be an uh, unattributed Buted copy of someone's el else work, you may be forced to repay profit uh, earned on the work to, be to the original owner. Say, uh, I'm not sure whether any of you know about this Australian man, uh, Australian band called Men at Work. Y M C A. Okay, so they were ordered to pay royalties to a publishing company after a judge found that they lifted a portion of an Australian school teacher's song. Uh, in the 1979 hit Down Under. So um, so there was a court battle and that, as a result, there has to pay, uh, uh, they have to pay some royalties uh, for this plagiarism. Okay. Um, and there was also a case, a woman who claimed that she was falsely accused of plagiarism while attending Harvard Law was forced to sue the school to clear her name. So, um, she take the lawsuit against the school, claimed that plagiarism charge, which she alleged was caused when the school law journal published an unfinished draft of an article. And it caused her to lose out a 160,000 year job offer. So in other countries, um, I think they will not hesitate to even take this further to court. Okay, and so that's why there's also some court sanctions. Uh, even lawyers have been caught up plagiarizing. Um, so there's a lawyer in overseas yeah, uh, who represented uh, Lindsay Lohan um, in, in, in multiple civil lawsuit was sanctioned $750 by a U.S. district court judge for plagiarizing the content of her legal brief. Hmm. Okay, so I guess if in Malaysia, if you're lucky, you're not uh, being accused of plagiarism because in uh, otherwise in U.S. Um, they, they would really uh, not hesitate to take this to court. Okay, next. 
Next, so consequences and effect, as you can see, as you mentioned earlier, so these are some of the general consequences, potential legal consequences of plagiarism um, in academics, especially um, how it's done. So you can correct me if I'm wrong. So there are warning letters, refuse degree certificates and expel from academic institutions. So um, I studied in Australia and um, uh, when, while I was studying, plagiarism was uh, a very serious, uh, uh, they, they take plagiarism really, really seriously. So there's so many Malaysians who are not very familiar on uh, this, who are just a lackadaisical attitude, who does not take seriously about plagiarism, uh, mostly had to learn a hard way about so this plagiarism. Um, and so I think um, these are some uh, ways how academics uh, are exercising plagiarism because it is, a, I think, uh, can be found in the university's um, legislation, university and I'm not sure, heck. So it's probably in there, but it is not in the copyright law. Okay, next. But having said that, uh, the difference is that in copyright infringement means that you're using someone else's work, such as songs, videos, movie clips, a piece of art, photos, other creative work, without obtaining their permission. Unlike plagiarism, it means that it's a failure to cite adequately or fail to get permission to use others' work. Others work. Example, you fail to put a quotation mark giving incorrect source of information. So uh, these are the different. So sometimes you cannot just say that uh, they have cheap luck, cheap luck, because sometimes in the media you see that they use those terms loosely. So uh, cheap luck, they pr probably mean uh, it's an infringement, So, but it's not. Right, next. Okay, so the difference is, um, I think we have uh, gone through here. Yeah, there it is. Plagiarism is a construct of ethics and is under Kaida 6, Kaida University, Tata Tertip, uh, under the Akta University and College University. But in copyright infringement, it's at least the court that enforced the copyright infringement. And that's why it's a construct of law. So, uh, and then uh, plagiarism is normally uh, enforced by the academic institutions. Okay, so these are the, the key difference between plagiarism and copyright infr infringement. So, for example, a person can plagiarize almost anything, including work that are not protected by copyright. So if you were to claim to have written Putri Gunung Ledang, for example, it will be a plagiarism, but not a copyright infringement because the play is in the public domain and is not protected by copyright. Also, plagiarism often covers things that are not covered by copyright. For example, ideas, facts, and general plot elements are all things that can be plagiarized, at least in certain situations, but generally do, do not qualify for copyright protection. So getting permission to use a work makes the use non-infringing thought. It might still be a plagiarism. For example, getting permission to submit a purchase essay means that the use is not an infringement, but it is still plagiarism as the work is not originally yours. So know the difference. Okay, next. Okay, and the other form of, let's say, uh, offense is with regards to copyright piracy. Now, copyright piracy means that the unauthorized reproduction for sale or use of a copyrightable work, such as book, lyrics, or software. Okay, and online piracy is, for instance, typically involved downloading, sharing the P2P, streaming, unauthorized content from the internet. Okay, next. Okay, so um, we have seen all, uh, in a nutshell, what are the copyright uh, importance. So as we can see here, that the importance of copyright are a vast because it is, for one, it's a legal necessity. The right holders of a creative content, they must understand copyright law because it safeguards their copyright, the work and the seed that they have sold to secure permission and of others before using copyright materials. Uh, it's not only a legal necessity, but also a good business sense. So as you can see, if you look this in the big picture, so this is 
software, how it helps uh, to become the economic spinner for a country. The best example I always say is Korea. You can see how Korea has turned into um, uh, their country uh, into a creative content, creative industry where it could it become an economic spinner. So copyright has its relevance. Copyright works, they are also property. Although you cannot see it, but it doesn't mean that they are not property. So it has a value that can be assessed as an intangible goods. So in that sense, it can be used as a collateral and securitization. Proving ownership is vital and can be done by voluntary notification. So for example, Michael Jackson, after uh, the demise of Michael Jackson, so he has obtained a, a catalog of copyright of Beatles. So those are values. And even when he is no longer around, but the value of uh, Michael Jackson himself and the book of say Star Wars, those are all, they have a value to it, uh, which then can become the um, source of income or like a duet pension for the copyright owner. So copyright industry, because you see copyright, uh, unlike um, the other uh, source of income, we say macam makan gaji, where you know, you know that you already get the money, but not for copyright. It's only say when you make the film, you already produce the film, and the, pro the film has, uh, has garnered about 200 million. So only from there that the money will go downstream to all the industries relevant uh, in the, uh, that are highly dependent on uh, one another. So the corporate industry are categorized as core, interdependent, non-dedicated support and partial. These are the people that are relying and it will flow the non-dedicated supports in the copyright industry. So that is why copyright is relevant. And you can see how, say, in the Western country, they know how to monetize their IP, their copyright. And for example, when, the, when they already have the the copyright because the anti-money laundering act we um were really puzzled on how um those international networking um they can siphon the money so we realized that those money are being used in buying tv rights so that the authorities will not be able to find out where did they hide their ill-gotten money you see how how clever people are with with uh, using their copyright so that's why the copyright is getting more and more importance, and it's um, it is a shame if the cop if the creative industry does not make copyright as the foundation or the base for them to uh, develop their creativity. Right next. So we next. Another one two minutes yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'm almost finished. Uh, timing is also uh, perfect. Okay, the copyright is stimulants for creative and cultural industry. Um, as we know that um, in order to build a strong and cultural sector, uh, capable of inspiring audience and generating content, we need to fully utilize copyright law as a strong foundation. Um, and then we, we know that it, it contributes to the GDP of a largest set of countries. Um, and then it's important to manage your copyright as well as intellectual property um, so that the country as well and the, cop uh, the right holders will see return uh, as the copyright, e copyright ecosystem to ensure that it is not upset. Okay, and the viability of the creative and cultural industries rests on the existence and proper functioning of the copyright system. Okay, next. So in summary, I'm going to wrap up that 
protecting copyright is essential to human creativity or not just that but also for the cultural and the nation and nation building so by giving creators the incentive because say music is not free ladies and gentlemen art is not free so you have to incentivize the creators in the form of recognitions and fair economic rewards then only you will see that creativity will be generated so this in turn increase access to and enhance the enjoyment of culture knowledge and entertainment work via copyright so uh, with that okay, next uh, i will have sum up my presentation uh, and thank you so much for your attention uh, for i don't know for how long i've been talking <laughs> but uh, it's been a very uh, enjoyable um uh, for, for me uh, i will uh, pass it back to the mc thank you very much thank you so much uh, Puan Rashida, for such clear explanation and presentation now i will open the floor to the audience for any questions i believe that Puan Rashida would be pleased to answer them uh, but be before that um we also like to i would also like to remind uh, the our attendees to um fill out your attendance through the link provided in the chat room uh, okay so any questions you may unmute your mic going Okay, since it's silent, can I just share my thoughts about um, the current affair, uh, affair right now? You see with the technology going on, they, um, we, we can't, uh, even if it's COVID-19 uh, pandemics, we can't avoid uh, uh, some of the activities going on, for example, like the election. So election should go on, but you can do it by way with technology, with the, uh, what do you call it, the not the bitcoin the oh god what do you call that uh god i i, I lost the word um uh not artificial intelligence there, there, there there's a few few things artificial intelligence uh there's bitcoins there's another word for b do you do you remember does anyone remember uh, Block, blockchain blockchain yes that's the one i was looking for with the blockchain you see um why i said so with the blockchain because um we're working with the enforcement division because enforcement who a copyright division in my phone doesn't have the enforcement arms so it's with the enforcement and it is so surprisingly to see how the enforcement uh, the the pirates copyright pirates can really use the blockchain in order to get to do the real time infringement for example premier leagues was showing in that 90 minutes of uh manchester united versus i don't know liverpool so it's only within that concentrated period but they are able to do a real time infringement of major several million million pound of loss if those piracy are clever people, they can do it by bit. Uh, sorry, again, by blockchain. So I think it's a, if if they were to be given the, uh, uh, if we were to hire all these intelligent people to do the blockchain for, uh, say, helping us with the election. So I think there will be a, a sheer amount of transparency and it will be a, a lot more easier. But these are just my two cents. <laughs> That is what is muted. <laughs> oh. uh, anyone have any questions or opinions that want to be expressed uh, in regards to today's talk or copyright in general? Well, I think perhaps because of the uh, much elaborative explanation provided by uh, Puan Rashida that I think the, all the attendees are you know, enlightened about all parts uh, of copyright law. Um, Puan, all right. Puan nak tanya, uh, apa yang macam mana yang kata? 
Uh, do you do you work with um, National Library on the issue of copyright? I mean, how to uh, I mean safeguard our protection of our uh, on, li on library services? Uh, what are the things that um, give us an update on that? What's going on now on IP and uh, National Library? Is there any talk to improve on this? But uh, the international uh, international now international level, we noticed that uh, the copyright has been extended instead of fifty years to more than maybe seventy years, but we are still at fifty years, something like that. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the question. Okay, about this protection 50 years, and of course, some other jurisdiction can see that their copyright term of protection are uh, up to 70 years, and say in the US, it's up to 90 years, and they even uh, want to extend it even longer to 100 years. All right? Is that, is that your question? Yes, yes. Is it necessary for okay. us to follow? So, uh, let me is it necessary that we follow? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, that's a very good question. Okay, in order for us to see whether what are the terms of protection that is uh, suitable for our economy, it all depends on whether are we creators yeah. of copyright or are we users? Okay, this is so important. So if we have more users using the copyright rather than creating the copyright, so users will have to pay royalty. So the, the money that flows out for paying royalties is more than uh, the money that we gain from the royalties of uh, the, the copyright. So if, say, we are a country that really uh, advocate the copyright and uh, creating more copyright. So it makes more sense to have the terms of protection extended to more than 50 years. But if we are users, so we have to pay all the way until 50 years, let alone if it's 70 years, so we have to pay an additional 20 years more of royalty. So this is more of an economic justification of countries why some of them adopt a 50 years approach and why are some of it having a 70 years approach normally countries with the more advanced uh, creativity industry more um, uh, a longer term of protection because they want to get more royalty so for example in the piramli's case okay he does not um uh, own most of this copyright. It belongs to Shaw Brothers. So if we were to end now, the uh, most of the Piramli's um, work is coming to a public domain, meaning it's more than 50 years. It's coming to an end. Say if it's extended to 70 years. Just imagine that we've been paying to Shaw Brothers for the last 50 years and we have to add another 20 years to pay to Shaw Brothers. So that is not justifiable. So unless there are so many of us who are creative users, so the government will want to consider to extend the copyright uh, terms of protection to 70 years or 90 years or whichever that uh, gives the uh, benefit of economic to the country. That, that's it. Any more questions? Open the floor again. Open the floor again. Uh, Puan Rashida, yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, Puan. So when works are being put on public domain, that means we are free uh. to use them? Your, your mic, Puan? Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, that's true, Puan. Uh, but sometimes you also need to uh, exercise precaution because some of those work that has gone to public domain, um, they may be revived. Like, for example, they has been digitalized and improved. So there's a new copyright work that uh, 
that has been created into it. So uh, you need to also look at uh, some of those extended copyright protection that uh, that is affixed to that, um, for example, the work. Do you remember Tintin, the adventure of Tintin? That has been public domain for quite some time. It's a very, very old uh, comic in the 1915. 1913 or 1915, I'm not mistaken. And now they have revised it and made the adventure of Tintin again. And so a new copyright uh, has emerged from that old public domain work. But uh, generally, yes, if it's gone to public domain, meaning there's no more proprietary to, to that particular copyright work. Uh, even even if uh, when if we uh, do works and then referring to the former Tintin, for example, so it is still uh, infringement. Uh, no, it? not uh, no, not because uh, the the original uh, Tintin it has uh, uh, no more the protection for copyright. But say the new work to it, uh, you it, there is a new uh, newly developed copyright to that Tintin work, although it is derived from that old uh, Tintin. But sometimes, say, maybe they put digitally enhanced to that old one. So you might have used this um, better version. So there are some copyright, uh, intricate uh, uh, copyright uh, in, in it that needs to be uh, identified and see. Say, for example, uh, some old Malay movies, the first version, um, the, the quality is so bad that they need to uh, redo the whole work. So it created a new copyright to it, even if it's a uh, old um, work. So some meanings, uh, there are certain circumstances that need to be seen. So it's not like a, a total yes, uh, it's gone to public domain um, and then uh, the term of the ex uh, protection expires. So um, the, the work is open uh, to all people and may be used for free. There are certain examples, especially in the US, uh, that needs to be, uh, needs to be, apa, uh, berhati-hati lah tu tengok. Because, uh, say, in some other countries, uh, orphan works are also uh, registered. They registered in the IP office. And so it's easier for them to obtain uh, the clearance. Say, these are totally free to use. But unlike in Malaysia, so you still need to exercise some judgment to see whether it, whether it is totally free of uh, copyright protections or otherwise. Thank you, Poen. Okay. All right. Um, lecturers, researchers, do you guys have any questions to us? Yes. Please don't uh, don't be shy. Uh, because today that. I'm your lecturer. <laughs> You're my student. <laughs> Uh, I think we can entertain like one last question. So anyone want to ask anything? So uh, if we have uh, any more questions in future, uh, can we uh, contact you? What? Yes, uh, by all means, please do not hesitate because uh, this is part of our job to, uh, to disseminate information, uh, to give awareness. It's, uh, uh, it, it is our job to, to assist, so uh, feel free. And uh, I also would like to take this opportunity to show that this is the book that uh, we have uh, developed. Um, it's called Copyright in an Internet Shell. It's a combined work between internet and nutshell so that to show that copyright in the digital world, how to use copyright. So we're going to give this book away, give away to the library and then uh, about 20 copies. So feel free to browse the book in the library, uh, IIU library. Um, and um, I hope that it's beneficial for everyone to have understanding of how copyright usage in the digital environment. So we can ask for more than 20? 
Oh, sure, of course. Oh, sure, uh, of course. Collaboration. Uh, collaboration. Uh, collaboration. Uh, Some of those works are uh, in this tiny text. And uh, you can see here some of the ecosystem, how safe copyright so that uh, the ecosystem, the link to it doesn't uh, leak. And just to show to people how it can really contribute to the economy and uh, oneself. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Uh, with that, I think that's all for today. As the saying goes, to every beginning, there is an ending. And with the, the last question just now, we are nearing such end. Once again, thank you everyone for gracing our event today with your presence. We truly appreciate it. On behalf of the library, I would like to apologize for any mistakes done throughout the event. If you have any inquiries on the copyright application in the future, do not hesitate to contact Madam Nozilatun, her head of copyright unit at IUM Library. And also, just like uh, Pon Rashida just now, don't hesitate to contact her as well. <laughs> uh, with that, um, with that, until we meet again virtually or physically, wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam.